Dom, man, I heard you're back on the diamond hitting dingers. Oh, I'm hitting dingers. Oh, man, I like to hear it. Yeah, I got lots of, uh... Lots of interest from that community, uh... Well, I like to hear that you're just, uh, back, you know, playing. I'm ba I'm back in the game. I'm off the bench. All right, and we're back at the Sports Experience Podcast. I'm here with my friend, Dom Datola. I'm his co-host, Chris Quinn. And we're just a couple of comics talking about sports. And today, we're actually not on the diamond. We're on the hardwood and in the court. In the court. No dingers, just the court. <laughs> talking Ed O'Banion... Ed O'Bannon, yes. Ed O'Bannon, thank you. One of the most important college basketball players of recent memory. Um, definitely carved out an interesting career for himself. Well, I mean, he was, he was definitely a great college basketball player. Nobody will deny that, but his uh, post-career is what everybody's talking about. Yeah, his post-career, which kind of makes people forget about when he was playing basketball, yeah. particularly up through his years at UCLA. So yep. let's... Uh, Let's get into, get into it. Mr. O'Bannon, uh, born August 14th, 1972 in Los Angeles, California area. Edward Charles O'Bannon Jr., actually. Ooh, and nice. We'll get that Charles uh, in during his college career. Was a terrific player growing up um, at uh, Verbum Day High School and then Artesia High School in Lakewood. And uh, really established himself as one of the state's best uh, basketball players. They won a state title the CIF Division II, his senior year, where he averaged 24.6 points a game and 4.7 rebounds. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty good. It, you think about him coming out of high school, I think he went to, a, and I, I don't mean any disrespect, but I think he went to a, a lesser sporting high school and then went to Artesia to... Yeah, boost to his stock. Exactly. So yeah. they went 29-2, and two, and it was obvious he was one of the big... Uh, college recruits. Yeah, that year he was the MVP of the Dapper Dan Classic. He was a McDonald's All-American um, and the Basketball Times High School Player of the Year. And even though he's from the LA area, didn't really want to go to any of the Pac-12 schools. Well, he looked into going to UNLV and there's this guy there and let me read his name. Excuse me. <laughs> Jerry... What is that? Jerry... Something Armenian, right? Something Armenian. Thank you. Episode 51. <laughs> check it out. UNLV. We'll get into it there. But um, he actually told him not to sign with them, which I thought was kind of interesting or, or a letter of intent with them. But see, this is the thing. This is 1990. This is because they won in 89-90, yes. and then 90-91, the only reason they got to play in that year's tournament is they were going on probation. Yes. So, so Tarkanian's probably like, look, we would love to have you here, but full disclosure, <laughs> the NCAA is basically trying to ruin us. And check out that UNLV thing, because... Some people say they didn't deserve that suspension. We are in that boat. So I'm just saying, like, if he would have brought Ed there, it really would have kept that program steaming. A flow, because he was a great player in college. Yep. And who knows what would have happened. Um, also, uh, this is kind of a fuck you NCAA podcast right now. So let's keep digging into that. I was going to say. He ends up going to UCLA, which makes sense. Yeah, he pretty much just goes back home. Yeah, it's a, it's a great team at this point. You know, they're always at the top of the Pac-10 with either them or Arizona. Yep. So, I mean, what, what else are you going to do? I mean, when UNLV is like, probably don't want to come here. Yeah, when the coach literally is just <laughs> like, hey, you're never going to see... <laughs> you're, March you're, basketball. Yeah, you're not going to go to March Madness. Not because you're not good and the team won't be good. Yep. It's just the the pitchforks and torches are out for us. But uh, goes to UCLA, um, looking like he could play pretty early, and then some unfortunate uh, happenings go on. So six days before their first practice, um, he tears his ACL. In a pickup game. In a pickup game, which I don't know. And this is my thing because they have to limit organized yeah. involvement with these guys. So I don't know if it was like, hey, you guys need to go pick up, play some pickup games. This, you know what I mean? I think 1990-ish, this is still a time where they don't have to monitor that shit. Oh, okay. Like This is probably more or less just dudes playing basketball as and, opposed to now. With well, all the rules and shit. Let's talk about this because he tears his ACL and the surgery for that back then is not what it is now. And it was pretty much like you're not coming back from this. Well, he 
took him 18 months to get right yep. after the surgery, and people were saying he wouldn't even walk properly again. That's what the surgeon, I think, said. He was just like, yeah, you're not going to be running on this, let alone like walking correct. You think you're going to play basketball. So yep. his entire 90-91 season is wiped out. It's, it, luckily, they have the redshirt year, so it's completely wiped out. Um, but he comes back to the team, amazingly enough, which is like, good for you, bro. Like, in 91-92, he starts to play well he's pretty much a freshman player at that point and he kind of is just an off the bench you yeah. know what i mean like getting into the system i bet making sure that knee is able to withstand the pressure so he's pretty much just the straight up freshman um second year yeah second i mean 90 or yeah 91 92 they're a great team too so he's pretty yeah. much limited to the bench only averaging about 13 minutes a game less than four points and uh less than four rebounds because they have like Don McLean and uh, a couple of other guys who were pretty good on that team. But uh, the following year is when it really starts to come together for them. Yes. 92, 93. Um, and team, that's his second year. Yeah, it's the second year. Team goes 22 and 11. Um, they lose in the second round to the Fab Five. Steve oh, Fisher yes. listened okay. to that episode. I was wondering when that was coming. I, that's They're, pretty good. But he makes all Pac-10, doesn't he? Yeah, he's a first team all Pac-10 yeah. in 92, uh, 93, and does a pretty damn incredible job for them. Plays in 33 games, starts 32, 16.7 points a game, seven rebounds, and 53.9% from the floor as a field goal percentage. The guy could shoot pretty well for a guy who's 6'8", 220-ish. Um, 93-94, finished second in the Pac-10. They go 21-7. and seven. Um, Also has an incredible year. Makes all Pac-10. Yeah. First team. Um, team MVP that year. Team like MVP. He, that's the... You can see this UCLA team is really turning into a great team, and he is this leader. Yeah, he's... And now he's one of the older guys because he's just only a third-year um, sophomore. Or, uh, no, it's a fourth-year junior, excuse me. Yep. 93-94. 18.2 points a game, 8.8 .8 rebounds, uh, 2.1 assists. So he could pass the ball too. Yeah, no, he's just – this is why I feel like he gets that team MVP is like he's that power forward you want where if they double down on him, he's just like, here you go. Yeah. And it, this is what reverberates as to why he was such a great college basketball player, and I feel like he doesn't really make it later on. He did everything well, but not elite. Exactly. That's and exactly – he does everything great, but or not great, but he does everything good, but not great. Um, and I changed your words. There you go. <laughs> the, that year was kind of shitty for them in the tournament. They lost one of those 12-5 games to Tulsa. Yep, I remember that. Oh, yeah. And uh, kind of a bracket buster type thing, but 94-95 – they are fucking loaded. Not only do they have O'Bannon, they have Tyus Edney, played in the NBA. Charles O'Bannon, his younger brother, played in the NBA. Yes. George Zydek, played in the NBA. Toby Bailey, played in the NBA. And then J.R. Henderson off the bench, also, I think, played in the NBA. Just, yeah, they are stacked. And you get these teams that are just pretty much NBA teams. Yeah, and... Their record reflects this. Yes. I mean, they finished the year 31-2 and two and get a number one seed in the tournament. And he completely balls out that year for them. 20.4 points a game, 8.3 rebounds, 2.5 assists, almost two steals a game, and 53% from the floor. That's the other thing that I really liked is his field goal percentage in college. It's just... He's an efficient player. Yes. And he's really good with a lot of good guys around him. Yep. UCLA rolls through the Pac-10. I think they lost only one or two games that year in conference, um, which obviously led to their two losses. Yeah. But um, they roll into the tournament, kill Florida International in the first round, and then barely squeak by Missouri. It's honestly one of the best college basketball games of the 90s as far as not being like a championship game or anything. Yes. Um, Tyus Edney had to go the length, basically the length of the floor to lay it in um, to just move to the Sweet 16. And move to the Sweet 16 – beat Mississippi State. Then they go to the Elite Eight and beat Ray Allen and UConn. They're in the Final Four. They play big country doofus Reeves in Oklahoma State in that uh, semifinal game. Yes. Roll right over them. Then they play defending national champions, Arkansas. Pretty damn good team. Well, I mean, a lot of people thought Arkansas was going to go back-to-back. -back. This was like yeah. their 
team right here, you know? God, imagine how many blowjobs Bill Clinton would have got if they won this game. But they didn't. O'Bannon with 30 points and 17 rebounds leads them. Which is such a crazy stat for a fucking championship game. But to come up that big, yeah. Oh my God. Thir- 30 and 17. That's such a ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. They win 89 78 and they're national champions. And after that, all of the postseason, postseason accolades come for Ed O'Bannon. He wins the national title, he's the tournament MVP, wins the Wooden Award. Co-Pac-10 Player of the Year with U of A's Damon Stoudemire. Yep. First team All-Pac-10 and first team All-American. So he had about as successful of a final season in college basketball as you'll ever see for anybody. Yeah. And he has the misfortune of entering a weak draft. And questions start coming up regarding O'Bannon. One of them, like you said, does everything well or but not great. Oh, yeah. but And that was the other thing was, like you were saying, it's a weak draft. So people are saying that he might have gotten drafted too high and the expectations were too high. But the thing was is when I think Antonio McDice was in there, he was really good for the Nuggets and uh, the Pistons. Yep. A couple of other dudes, but it's not like you're, you know, the 96 draft is where it's at as far as the NBA, like we've talked about before. But... um He even said pre-draft, I don't want to go anywhere off the West Coast because that's where he's from. Which I you you hear shit like that and you're like this, that's not good. But there were kind of two big things working against him just as a pro player. Number one, his knee. There were a lot of questions about his ACL tear from 1990. And understandably, what a lot of people don't know is while he could function in college, he didn't have the type of speed and quickness in the NBA require almost like Adam Morrison we had talked about. Yes. If you're a step slow, that's going to, it opens up the wing a lot of the time. And his size, while for any human being, great, 6'8", 220, in the NBA, particularly that era, you're in no man's land as far as a position is concerned because you're not necessarily strong enough or possess the paint game, the dominant paint game to be a four, to be a power forward. But your lack of, you know, lateral quickness and everything else and inability to really be a high level shooter, you can't play the three either. So you have to find kind of somewhere to play him. And he's kind of a tweener, kind of a question mark. But the New Jersey Nets take him. Uh, Number nine overall. Yep. And it, like we were saying, it's probably just one of the worst things to happen to him because he said he doesn't want to go outside of the west coast um i feel like he gets drafted too high yep. and it's pretty much just like a bad situation well and it's the fucking nets drazen petrovich is dead and Derek coleman is turning into hedonism bot from futurama yeah like i mean no disrespect to that not disrespect to him but like the nets are basically dog shit until the late 90s early 2000s and he's kind of part of that um Signs a three-year, $3.9 million deal and comes out his rookie year and is uh, a little bit underwhelming. And homesickness plays a factor, but also a lack of confidence plays a factor. Yeah, I saw him actually say that where uh, a lot of people are wondering if it was the ACL or if it was, you know, being on the West Coast. And he said a lot of it was confidence where he would miss shots that he knows he could make and that he would make in college and... This is something that I feel like when players come from college, they might not get coddled the way they were. Yeah. And this was a player that maybe needed a bit more encouragement, especially in that first year. I have a quote here. It says, uh, it wasn't my injury. It was confidence. I missed shots, got pulled from games. It affected my defense. Yeah, I think that'll do it. Yeah. I mean... His first year, he averages less than 20 minutes a game, only starts less than 30 games, 6.2 points a game, 2.6 rebounds, and this is 95-96. In 96-97, 45 games, 5 starts, 4.2 points a game, 2.5 rebounds, and then that's just get rid of him. They cut bait. Yeah. It's it's obvious that they're not going to develop this guy into a player, so they they pretty much just trade him to the Mavs for dog shit. Yeah, for 
basically nothing, uh, 2.4 points a game in Dallas. And then in September of 97, he's traded to the Magic and doesn't even do anything with him. Well, he's traded to the Magic so they can release him. It Pretty was much. one of yeah, those deals. Sign trades, yeah. Exactly. Um, Armin Gilliam, one of his teammates from the Nets, had a really good quote. He said, um, he's a guy who couldn't find his niche in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, that's straight up because I feel like he could have developed into a bench player. Yeah, like a solid seventh guy. Exactly. You know, and he finishing the quote, it said, he wasn't in the um, right situation to grow and develop. He never got the opportunity to prove what he could do. Yeah, that's true. And when your NBA career ends, where do you go? You got to go to Europe, man, especially overseas, <laughs> especially now. But in this era, especially, um, or I mean, in this era, you would go and just kind of like we see his career. You would just go bounce around Dominique Wilkins style. Exactly. But um, you get these one year contracts and then they'd be like, all right, that was fun. Good to see you. Like, it, it's interesting. So seven seasons overseas in Italy, Spain, Greece, Argentina and Poland even played for the new ABA's L.A. Stars. I saw that. But it, the one thing you brought up, I wanted to say he had only one year contracts, none over four hundred thousand dollars, which isn't chump change. But if you're saying, playing pro basketball, like that's he wasn't even then. He wasn't a star for these teams, if that makes sense. So he was a good player. Um, yeah, it's not like you're bringing over a Dominic Wilkins. You know, um, yeah. It said uh, he tried out for a team in China, but the people trying him out hadn't even heard of him before, and that's when he knew it was over. Yep. And then when asked about kind of his career, he said. 12 teams, six countries, 15 coaches, which is kind of a disastrous recipe for anyone trying to find uh, their well, especially uh, career for some, in pro ball. For someone that needs to be developed. Yeah. it's This is like the worst layout. It's almost like the Freddie Adu, where it's just like, we're just going to throw him to a team every other year. And it's just like, that was fun. Yeah, no cohesion, no ability to be with a coaching staff, anything like that. So his career is basically over, and... For a while there, he was working as a car dealer in Las Vegas. Yeah. Just enjoying life. Just I mean, enjoying sure life. sure saved his money. Probably just, I'm going to coast here. and. Well, this is where in the story we got became the... became a probation officer later in Vegas. But let's uh, get into uh, his post-career activities. We got, well, this is where we got the plate. We got the fork. We got the knife. We got the A1. And now we need the steak. We need the Here's steak. Here's the meat of the story. Where he was at his friend's house. I think this is when he was working at the car dealership. Yeah, they were just hanging out playing video games. And his friend's son was playing an NCAA basketball game. And literally, Ed goes, that's me right there. And it's UCLA. It's a man or a character on the game that looks exactly like him. Number 31. Number which 31. Which is retired by UCLA. His, he's left-handed. He's a power forward. It was like literally all his stats, but then no name. They used to not name these players. They never they, would name them because if they did, they would have to pay likeness rights. Exactly. So he brings them to court. Um, so he starts this um, class action lawsuit against the NCAA that... He's the lead plaintiff. His name is on the doc document. So like it's O'Bannon versus NCAA. Exactly. And it's an antitrust lawsuit. And I found this so interesting because it's pretty accurate as to what the um, NCAA does is they collude to make ath student athletes believe that they're not worth more than their scholarship. Exactly. And don't get me wrong, a scholarship is nice, but that doesn't give you like walking around money. No. That doesn't. And the, most of these guys, or I shouldn't say most, but a number of these guys don't even graduate. They're not even there. Or get scholarships. What the NCAA basically has done is create a cartel and a feeder system to where, and this is why I always respect hockey and baseball more, because these players can make their own fucking choices when they're 16 to 18 years old of what they want to do legally as adults. Exactly. No, you're so 100% right. Is it creates a free minor league system for professional football and professional basketball. And it's all a money game where the people who are putting asses in seats, who are on posters, whose jerseys without their names on them are being sold in the student bookstore, aren't seeing one red cent of their fucking labor. And well, we see, and this is what, because he originally sues the NCAA and people are thinking it's basketball, but then it fucking spills over to the big money horse, which is 
college football. Yeah. And that's the big one where you see, because that, it, that generates so much money. College basketball generates a lot of revenue, particularly from March Madness. Yes. College football, dear fucking Christ. The amount of money, it's money hand over fist. Yep. For a lot of, like, a ton of program. Most college football programs, the reason that they exist is to subsidize the other non-revenue generating sports in their athletic department. So... Just to, yeah, just to put it in perspective. So, O'Bannon goes to court for this antitrust lawsuit and actually wins. Um, there's a bit of nice uh, court stuff that happens. Well, basically what the judge... Uh, Claudia um, Wilson said, well, yeah, w- I'm sorry. What was it? I think it's Wilkin Wilkin. Yeah. Claudia Wilkin said was no, you win. Basically you win because universities should not be making money off your likeness and taking that money away from you. So and this- video game companies too, like electronic arts who took it in the shorts and that's why we don't have those video games which while it pisses me off it was done for the right reasons this was the thing that she said was ruled that the ncaa long the ncaa's long-held practice of barring payments to athletes athletes violated the antitrust law because they were making so much revenue off obvious things like we were saying this was obviously him in this game And it was, I think it was close to a decade after he had played. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's probably decade, decade 10, 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Something like that. Um, So, and that's what they were saying was, I think they are still able to make money off of them when they're in school, but they can't post school. And then, yeah, this was the other thing when the lawsuit started to gain steam. I Oscar saw Robertson joined like, Oscar yeah. Robertson, Bill Russell joined because these were all players that were like looked at as great players that were in these games year in year out. Yeah. Um, I just want to say these games were the best sports games. Oh, ab- even over Madden, in my opinion. That's I just didn't my play opinion. Madden. I only played college football, <laughs> and that's what kind of got me out of watching football in that era because it was such a it was a, such a staple for me and my brother playing it all the time. That was our jam was the NCAA football Same games. Same here, man. Oh, yeah. Um, I just want to say the court ruling for the time – People were like, holy shit, that's a lot of money. It was $40 million for the class action. If it was today, oh, dear God. it would be like half a billion. Easily. And that's the thing is they didn't realize the amount of revenue that EA could really bring in. And Yeah, they really weren't paying attention. They were more just like, hey, we need to nip this in the bud yep. right now to prevent any of this from happening. And when you think about the economics of the situation, okay, Let's play the magical game where tuition counts as your salary. Twenty to forty thousand dollars for a big university. Okay, you're making that money. How many people for twenty basketball games a year paying, let's say, fifty dollars, twenty to fifty dollars per ticket, and those are just regular tickets, not courtside, not anything like that. How much does that money accumulate over time? It's probably way more than fucking um, your tuition, and that includes your jersey sold in the bookstore, posters of you, posters of the team being sold. I mean, so much merch. It's so much alcohol sales on the weekend. Between so much, yeah. the money that, in his case, Polly Pavilion makes when the Bruins play, what their student bookstore makes, what their athletic department makes off of him and his teammates that doesn't even it doesn't even fucking equate it's 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 completely unfair i'm not saying you need to pay these guys like professional athletes considering they're so young give them a goddamn cut for their labor yes (laughs) no it's crazy and while we see a lot of these young kids go uh, in basketball we see them possibly go to europe or there was this new league that was recently started where they were talking about playing paying each player something like 80,000 to 100,000 to play in this year it was almost like a G League yeah but it's like you're paying them like you would like a regular professional in regular society who is skilled 
in their early 30s as they're building a nest egg as they're growing. I'm just know? saying this is the thing that the is happening in, in basketball. There's no, nothing. I was just going to bring that there's up. There's no avenue for football, and that's the huge revenue. And I feel like that was when this happened, they kind of were like, that's fine. Pay as much as you want because we football need to not be touched by this because yep. they. it was almost like the door opening up like, oh, shit, we – kids want to get paid they don't want to be a uh, uh, 20 or 21st century slaves which is the if you want to check out that student south park, athletes that <laughs> south park episode crack baby football it's or so unbelievably crazy oh my god and it's, it's so fucking right. accurate it's as so shit dude right but that's what i mean with this lawsuit was it it opens the door and everyone's like oh shit can we not make a billion dollars off of this like right. it's it's quite the interesting lawsuit well and here's the thing with basketball like you said they're developing these leagues and stuff for guys and basketball this is why i feel bad for the football players is yeah you can just play overseas for a year go to the draft and get drafted in basketball yep they only have the one year rule also basketball in comparison to football not to shit on basketball you need to be a grown-ass man to play football like you can get away with a development year or two in the NBA in comparison, considering this isn't the eighties or nineties where they're playing actual defense and hand checking you and basically bad boys, bad boysing you around the court football. You're locked in for at least three years, which is basically like an indentured servitude contract. Yep. And that's kind of the main argument that they use is like, you can't let a 19 year old play in the NFL and, they're kind of right, but there is no other avenue. Yeah, there's no other way for these guys to develop, get paid for their labor without basic. It's like the fucking military. You're signing your life and health and everything away for at least three years, hoping some, there's something at the end of the rainbow. That's why when particularly running backs come out in the draft, whenever those guys come out early, I'm like, dude, go you. Yep. Like, and you That's, play the position which is the most you know injury injury prone prone fucking yeah. shortened careers well that's the thing other thing about basketball and this is the back to forth with these two is football is the injury prone sport exactly and basketball has made this i feel like it evolved over the last two decades into having these guys have this ability of like they're a rookie we understand they suck and i it, it's yeah fucking crazy to think like we're paying money for these professionals to be like no 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 we get it he's developing but you're right that does not happen in football outside of like we're gonna put this quarterback in week six we're gonna I, we understand yeah. the rest of the season's done the rest of the season's a wash let's that's see the, what the kids got let's go for that number one pick seriously though that's the only time you really ever see that you don't see it in role positions you don't see it in really anything else and like yeah. you were saying when you see a, a running back come out early you're like fuck yeah man make that million go dollars get, you, get that you're paper done. motherfucker yeah. <laughs> like but this is one of those things where nobody saw this lawsuit doing what it did. And I fucking love it. Oh, and I that's love why it. I wanted to do Ed O'Bannon today. I know. Not, be, not only because he had a great college career and was Wonderful fantastic, college, yeah. yeah. But because of this lawsuit and because it's still important now. He never saw it coming. He thought... No, he probably... if he Imagine if he didn't see his friend's son playing a video game. I know. Like... We could be, uh, because now... We could be playing NCAA football. Fuck, man. We probably might not have this podcast. It'd just be us live streaming it. Just fucking like, now NCAA I'm taking football. the Wildcats to the championship again. Oh, my God. That's 10 seasons in a row. You know their football program is not good. <laughs> because we're living in an illusion. But no, uh, um, no, it was an important lawsuit because now... But now you're going to start seeing fucked up shit, in my opinion. You're going to start seeing, because of Title IX nonsense... Everyone has to get paid the same, even though they're not equally putting out the same product as far as revenue and everything like that. So you could have men's college basketball players and men's college football players and any of the revenue generating sports basically fucking subsidizing the salaries of these non-revenue generating sports, most of which 
happen to be female. I didn't I, like not I know sexist, you, hey, but I'm just saying is Dom's out there hitting dingers. But let me say this though: if the money is right across the board, I don't think because they generate. Here's what's not going to happen. I'm just saying, um, because they generate so much money, they literally could be paying all of these student athletes like a good. Like even if it was stipend, yeah. even if it was equal, I'm just saying that could happen. It will never happen. But like that's my takeaway from it is like you could prorate it. I guess depending yes, on you know that's that what it should shit. be. Like have something separate for all these sports players, and those are like twelfth guy off the bench for basketball. They exactly. Don't do sh- like I shouldn't say they don't do shit, but they don't contribute in the way that somebody else does. But then there's always I feel like there's always going to be tiers of that shit, even within a team. Yeah. And there have to be tiers because you're not buying the 12th man on the fucking benches jersey at the bookstore. Are exactly. You? So exactly. like that. Should there be should be. A st- I was going to. There yeah. should be a standard and then there should be like almost like a merchandise revenue. But that's the other thing is like these colleges, they I feel like it's going to get worse before it gets better. Oh, I am in complete agreement with that one. Yep. Yeah, it's going to get worse. And I'm sure that the NCAA, with all of their money, Scrooge McDuck style, it's going to try and counter sue. Oh, 100%. Point and be like, oh, you're ruining this. And you know who's going to be backing the NCAA in all of this? More than the NBA will be the NFL. Oh, yes. The NFL, because when it comes to baseball, you have probably like a 16 minor league system that you have to fucking keep up with and keep payroll for. You have a fucking in the NHL, you have a couple of separate leagues. I don't soccer. It's like that. Yeah. You have these, you have these youth teams where it's exactly like it's youth 17, it's youth 18. And then they get into these, like it would be like double a triple a in football. It's literally like Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll yeah, take. It's like Alabama draft team, NFL team. You're from Florida, <laughs> yeah. But that's the. You're right. That's the thing that NFL doesn't want to miss out on is this free, fucking slave like auction. It's absolutely insane. I would consider it more indentured servitude, but you're oh, right on you. the that's, button. You're right. Like, because technically you're making you're a wage paid. but you're not being paid what you Before. should be paid yeah. yeah exactly so thank you ed o'bannon for bringing this all of this horrible shit to light and for being a very good college basketball player well i just want to say he ruined one of my favorite video games and i still think the man is amazing and back him on his lawsuit hey he's even an author now what was it i was looking through it he wrote a book back in uh actually uh 2018 oh nice called court justice nice which is awesome the dun, inside dun. story of my battle against the ncaa and he eventually graduated from ucla so good for you ed o'bannon hey everybody this is just a stock message at the end of every episode we hope you enjoyed whatever athlete and or team that that episode was about just want to say give us a quick follow on all social media we have a youtube channel the sports experience podcast and we're on instagram to tolo dominic and myself c quinn comedy so give us a follow all around um we're always recording right here at angle studio thank you all very much